Yeah, well, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, so I'm going to flip through a number of things on these talks. Thank you for the, inv thank you for the invitation to come and talk. Um, I'm going to be talking mainly about the nitride materials, an area I got involved in about 15 years or so ago. Um, nitrides are somewhat interesting. Um, I can think of them, I talk about them here as being a universal solution for uh, energy applications, and I'll kind of cover a little bit of their use in, um, in solid state lighting, in solar, and also TE, um, TE applications, which we started doing recently, or that. So, just to give an overview of that. But there's, um, there's an old American movie, which I'll come back to later on. It's called Annie Get Your Gun. Do you know, it's a song in this that goes along the lines of anything you can do, I can do better. So uh, I kind of think that the nitrides are the universal compound semiconductor material and anything you can do, I can do better. So they can actually be used in many different areas. And I'll kind of give a myopic of some work that we've done um, with the nitrides over a number of years. Obviously anything I show here is, a, is kind of a survey of work that we've done. And I've been, it's been my privilege to work with many people um, over many years whose work I've shared. Here's some Bob, I worked with Bob and um, also Alan um, as part of the um, solar VSEC program, which I'll, I'll mention about and uh, I'll mention about this as we go through. Um, currently based at UNC Charlotte, which is kind of on the East Coast. Uh, actually arrived here Monday morning or that, caught up with some sleep, not mainly because of jet lag, but because of work lag. Whenever you travel, you're working like mad to try and catch up on things. And people ask you, you know, do you get jet lag and I say no if you're working hard enough you shouldn't notice because you should always kind of be on the somewhat on the edge of um, tired or so so I finally got out of my hotel and I walked down to I'm in Kochi Beach and I walked down towards Kochi Beach and I turned the corner and I looked at the beach and somebody said hello Ian which was Bob who happened to be out it was like a million to one chance he happened to be out running that day, I think it was about 20 or 30 minutes from home. And if I'd gone there like two seconds earlier, all I would have seen was his back and I wouldn't even have known. But um, I think my wife says, wherever I go in the world, I always bump into people I know for some reason. Um, so ECE, one of the reasons I joined UNC Charlotte, and I'll just put a couple of background slides up, was because of the development of this center, which is synergistic actually with I think my laser's working on here, which is actually somewhat synergistic with um, this Energy Power and Infrastructure Center. So the idea was uh, Charlotte actually had a downturn. It was like second largest economic, or second mar largest commercial banking um, market um, in the US after New York. Or that When things kind of crashed in 2008 or so, they were kind of laid bare and they discovered that we did have power infrastructure, so they started looking at how do you support power infrastructure in and around the Charlotte area. So part of that actually relates to, um, relates to this. Although I did, I did read in coming here, because I'm looking at Australia, that Australia has not been in recession for at least 21 years or so, which is actually, which is actually fairly good. I tell people I like working in academia because it's never in recession as well, because it seems to be always somewhat permanently in recession. Or that. So we built this building, which we moved into, about the same time you did, probably just a bit after. Um, it's about 200,000 square feet, primarily um, houses the ECE department, um, civil, and then what we've also done in some of the halls is we've mixed people from other places. Um, America, they like their football, so they just stuck in a new football stadium as well. So our building actually has the best views of the football stadium. So now the chancellor turns up at the president of the university to our building, primarily to show the uh, football fields. They actually put a nice infrastructure within the building, I think, for that reason. This building was laid gold. I, I, I don't know what the, thank you, the analogy is in this same um, thing. Um, there's very few buildings get get platinum above that. I've been in platinum buildings, like platinum buildings in the US, and by that time they all kind of look like polished concrete um, or that, and when you walk in them you actually ruin their ratings, so um, the buildings are good as long as you don't go in them. What's interesting, this building actually has shading on the side here, and my office is on the back, and it's there, and it has three windows with the shading. What it actually sounds like a set of drums when it rains, as well, because these things kind of stick out. So it's a design feature which the architects, I don't think, actually knew about. As soon as it rains, I can't even talk on the phone in my office anymore if it's in the right direction. Um, 
or that. And the building is mixed. It has one of the largest high bays um, for large beam testing, primarily nuclear applications and that. And this is the second floor. And then we've got offices where we're actually mixing faculty from different disciplines within the offices. So, you know, there's still core departments, but we're still trying to get people mixed and kind of talking to each other. The other thing that we started doing in the last year, and unfortunately I wasn't able to log on to, to the university system to show you the video or that, so I cut in a picture of a different building, but we've been competing in the solar decathlon program, which is going to be July this year, so it's making a solar plus house, so enough solar on there that you can also go and add back into the grid, charge cars and other things or that. And this building's kind of designed as an indoor-outdoor, it's kind of difficult to see here, uh, building where actually the panels move back and forward. Did a similar competition in our building when I was at Georgia Tech prior to UNC Charlotte. And these buildings are interesting because of the mixture of work with architects. So this I proposed to the previous uh, talk and then a lot of it's about the integration of your systems within the building. And you're supposed to build these at less, about, less than about $300,000 in total for a prototype, um, for a prototype building. So this is one we did at Georgia Tech as well. Um, the EPIC, we have an educational focus, um, so we're worried about um, feeding in to the, some of the sponsors and the stakeholders in terms of um, education. We also have research clusters, um, so I, I head up the renewables and energy efficiency cluster within the centre as well as um, running the ECE department. Then most of these other things you'll find are ECE disciplines, so it's all about grid, microgrid, integration, grid integration and power. Not an area I knew about before I arrived there, but I had to build up programmes in that area. Then we have some other things and some of our sponsors. So we got money in from people like Duke and Siemens. Um, I think they sponsored about $4 million or so each and others. Um, one of my first hires at UNC Charlotte was actually one of your own, was Abba Bong, um, who graduated out here a number of years ago with, from Stuart, nice guy, so he was my first, um, one of my first hires when I moved to um, UNC Charlotte, knew him for about 12 years. Universally, the people who come through this program I've seen are both technically competent, but they also actually tend to be reasonably good people to be around, and it's good to have that mix of people who are both technically competent and just people you enjoy and just people you enjoy um, um, being with. So this comes back to the and get your gun thing. Anything you can do, gun can do better. Um, and what's the idea here? In part, and actually I'm cutting the wrong slide here, in part most compound semiconductor materials, 3-5 materials, so if you want typically thin semiconductor layers that strongly absorb or emit light, you typically won't use silicon, it's um, covalent. Um, you need ionicity within your material um, to get strong absorption or emission of light. So typically you're moving into 3.5 um, materials, which then means you have to play around for different wavelengths, a whole hodgepodge of different um, materials. And for solar applications, if you want tandem cells of that, you're starting to play around with germanium, um, which is down here somewhere. Um, you're starting to play around with, um, it could be silicon, gallium arsenide uh, base cells, gallium indium arsenide base cells, gallium phosphide base cells and that. So uh, part of the thrust and one of the interests in the nitrides is the fact that the band gap of indium nitride in the graphic, I don't think worked on this one, um, is now about 0.65. So it means in these nitride materials, gallium indium nitride, you can kind of cover almost everything you do in the 3.5 materials, if in fact you can actually make them, um, if in fact you can actually make them work. So one material system allows you to pick up any band gap that you want whatsoever. It then also means if that's the case and you can grow the materials and the structures, that you should also be able to use these obviously as emitters and for, um, and for other applications. So um, this thing of anything you can do, GAN can do better is I believe the direction you're going to move in with these compound semiconductors materials. And nitrogen, there's a lot of nitrogen around um, and you don't have to worry about things like arsenic, t um, <coughs> TLV, toxic limit, toxic threshold limit in, um, nitro in arsenic is like 50 parts per B, 50 parts per billion. Um, if you take a nitrogen tank, and I used to have at least two 50 pound tanks sitting on site and opened up one, 
in the middle of a place like this, you probably lose about 2,000 2, people in terms of crash. So a lot of these materials are highly toxic, so being able to move away from them is naturally bad. Just some mention, I'm going to come back to lighting as such. Uh, I developed interest in solid state lighting, I think back in about 96 or so. I was working at a company called MCOR and these lights and solid state lights, so a lot more people are a lot more familiar with them now, are really like solid state analogues of um, of a fluorescent tube. If you actually look in in electronics as a so as a whole, they tend to go towards solid state applications where previously you've actually had okay, thank you. Where previously you've actually had some type of um, um, vacuum tube. So if it was originally it was a vacuum tube, you moved to silicon, CRT tubes to flat panels and that. And the press question now is can you get rid of the vacuum tubes and lighting or that. And solid state lighting is really an analogue of that. But I had some other interest in terms of lighting. That lighting light also works like a drug. If you actually get it at the right level, it has a physiological impact on you and how you behave within the environment. So there's things you can do which are kind of interest in terms of here making sources that can kind of walk up and down the planking, so black body equivalent for how the sun behaves during the day. So I've written up proposals in the past for lighting systems for moon bases and that where you don't only have the lighting but you can give people the correct physiological cues and you can go in with very narrow band gap light and essentially kick um, um, receptors in the in the ganglion cells and um, they, they have um, light sensitivity. So we were making sources which were essentially um, dual sources with phosphors where you could actually mix and pump preferentially into phosphors and then walk up and down the um, walk up and down the, the planking. Other things we've been doing, we had an interest, um, I have an interest in spintronics. So the idea here is if you want very low voltage um, systems and obviously higher voltage, higher power is always a concern. But spintronics is the ability to be able to control the spin on the electron. Electronics, you're just controlling the electron moving around. Spin, you control the spin on the electron as well. So you can actually polarize the electrons so each electron becomes spin up, spin down. So you've got a binary function. In localizing or interacting, um, and against a form of quantum computing, you can get multiple level systems as well, as long as you can control the spin. Um, our primary interest in this had been more towards spin emitters. It's kind of a hard problem because um, you need to make semiconductor materials that have a Curie temperature that's higher than room temperature, that, so you still see the magnetic properties of the of the materials, it's a whole, a whole other talk, but we managed to do this with gadolinium based materials and actually show in LED some type of spin emission and spin injection. So now you can actually control the spin polarization on the device um, on the fly. It's kind of some interesting physics of that. Um, other things I backed into, um, I always tell people that the important thing with research is to have an ex a research expertise but at the end of the day, your expertise should also be research. So it's an ability to move in and through different problems over time. So even the students here, as you learn a particular skill set, what matters is how you take and you can actually pass that skill set from PV or you can pass it into other areas over time. Otherwise, you get a, a knowledge at the end of the day that at some point can look historical if you get pinned in one thing. And as you move further away in time, it can almost look hysterical as well. So um, the trick is with research is to be able to move through problems. So I stick in gadolinium in these materials. It turns out that gadolinium has the largest um, neutron cross section. I'm a physicist with by training years and years ago. Most in, in the US, a lot of evolved physicists are electrical engineers because you get paid 20 to 30 percent more for doing the same job. So the, the good physicists um, become engineers over time um, and then stay there. Um, but the trick is here is just to have fun. You just move through things into other problems. So we backed into some work in um, thermal neutron, um, thermal neutron um, detection, primarily because the gadolinium had the largest um, cross section for thermal neutrons of any material. And then you could actually make diodes that could be um, that would be good for thermal neutrons. 
important if you're bringing, you know, into the US or probably into Australia as well, if you're bringing nuclear compounds in that people don't want around, it's ways of detecting these um, materials. There's a rule as well, generally, that you want to go where the where you, you want to go where the money is as well. You can create opportunities um, in your research and kind of move in and through them. Um, last thing is that we're starting to look at these multifunctional devices, so it's no longer electro optics, but it's electrical, magnetical, and optical. So there's things where you can self-induce fields within waveguides and other things and play around with them. But the trick here is is just to have fun and move through have fun and move through different problems. So um, three nitrides for solid state lighting, um, really a lot of the times the reasons why people got into the nitrides was the fact that you were able to produce these emitters that had this blue, highly efficient blue slash UV light and then this light could be used for preferentially pumping a phosphor or that which then gave you broadband emission or that. The devices that people have made haven't really advanced that much from that type of um, <coughs> case or that. But the primary issue is that if you look at incandescence uh, efficacies, about 10 to 15 lumens per watt, in the US, I'm not sure what they're doing here, they're starting to legislate out incandescent bulbs, so people are moving towards these compact fluorescents. In Scotland, they were somewhat more intelligent. They discovered the compact fluorescents were somewhat ugly, so when they got rid of the incandescence, everybody went to halogens instead, which were only about 20 lumens per watt, but a nicer source to deal with and a better form factor. Um, now you have LEDs, um, where you have um, efficacy up to about 100, 200 lumens per watt, depending on the power spectrum of the, um, of the device. These devices can vary. These devices can actually vary in quality. So this is the traditional type of LED and they haven't really moved away from this type of thing of having a blue source. You have a phosphor, some of the blue light leaks through and then the mixture of the two lights is a bi essentially bichromatic source and even if you add on to phosphorus that work better in the red or that to get a, core, a source that looks slightly um, cooler, so not cooler, warmer. Um, it's still this bichromatic source. Um, the primary issues then have in making these type of devices um, becomes how efficiently can you get the light out from this very small volume um, of material and typically for lighting good form factors are, are larger sources because you want to create some type of non-imaging optic system to give you light that's over a large area without a million little shadows over your hand. Um, and other things. Uh, the primary driver as well of efficiency in the US, uh, if you look at the US, it's a, it's a somewhat interesting thing. People don't really know a lot about energy efficiency there. If you look at the world um, as a whole, we use about 500 quadrillion BTU equivalent of energy. The US uses about 100 or that. So you have about one twentieth of the world's population, it might even be higher, using 20 to 25 percent of the world's um, energy of that. So somewhat interesting. You know, they talk about the American dream, you know, um, as such, and I, I think that they're going to discover if they continue in this way that the American dream may in fact become a dream at some point because it's not, it's really not sustainable. Um, it's really not sustainable. Um, if you then look at lighting within those 100 quads, um, about eight quads are for lighting. So if you even get about a 10 to 15% um, efficiency improvement, um, then you've saved about one quad. So it means you can get rid of Ohio or something like that, the equivalent of getting rid of a state. You're not from Ohio, are you, Alan? No, so I didn't choose the right state. So this is um, pictures of where I've been in the world that has solid state lighting. This is Scotland, and um, this is Nancy. I used to live near Met, so that. Um, I think I got some of the others. Um, I spent time, um, I initiated, was involved in a lot of the original Chinese programs in solid state lighting. So I spent a lot of time in China, lived in Wuhan for a while, also lived in Taipei for about six months or so. My Chinese name for the people who are here is Fu Yi Shi. My tone's poor now because I haven't talked Chinese for about 
five or six years a lot. So it's Taifu or Shufu the Fu, teacher. Taifu I like because teacher to the emperor. Chen Shai Yi Yi the Yi and then Chen Shi the Shi. Chen Shi uh, ties into morning sunshine. So it's actually a fairly, it's a somewhat fairly complicated Chinese character. I know it's Chinese will start writing with their fingers if they're complicated for some reason. But I like Taiwan. Wherever you go in Taiwan to visit somewhere, there was always somewhere something to eat as well. So you, so you were always told when you go to see something, there was something that you'd have to go and eat. Um, <coughs> so this was for Egypt. So what we were doing most recently is that these things drive into um, cost. And obviously anything that you can integrate into silicon um, will tend to typically reduce your cost. Um, in the nitrides as a whole, the substrates are typically 100 to $200 or so, so the ability to be able to grow on silicon is good for um, lighting devices. I put this up because I know there's a number of people look here who are looking at how do you take silicon and modify it to improve its, or to enhance its behavior as, for example, a solar cell or that. Um, it's a difficult problem because silicons, you're, you're dealing with a polar, non-polar surface. You then have to try and deal with some type of transition layer in between the silicon to the 3.5 material. The general issue of growing a compound semiconductor or 3.5 on silicon as a whole is a hard problem. And a lot of this stuff, the idea of this talk is more of an overview um, of these areas. Um, if people have interest in a specific area, I normally have another hour or two talk behind so I can always go through things in, through things in detail. So we'd start developing techniques for looking at other substrate technologies such as zinc oxide um, for lighting applications and zinc oxide was problematic because of zinc oxide you have an oxide in a nitride environment, a highly reducing uh, environment. So when the students first started growing the samples um, they thought they'd lost the samples um, and in fact what happened was they dissolved the samples before they could grow on them or that. And we started developing these interface technologies that we just that we could use universally in other areas. Um, it's an American company, uh, well, not America, Australian company, Blue Glass, who do kind of similar types of things, but, but different. Um, our devices are always crystalline. So our thing here was to be able to take and simplify the growth on silicon, where you have to deal with thermal mismatch, you have to deal with um, um, essentially polar, non-polar, growth where you get these low angle grain boundaries and other things that form within the material. So we did things where we compare the growth on both the um, silicon and then with these different types of um, aluminum oxide buffer layers. So most of the technology for growing the nitrides has been on sapphire which is aluminum oxide. So what we were doing here was putting in an aluminum oxide buffer, um, buffer layer. Uh, what we're showing here is is typical properties on silicon. The main thing to pull out is these X-ray line widths. Typically, you want them to be down below about 300, well, 400 for the off-axis reflection, around about 180 to 200 for the on-axis. Uh, again, not enough time to talk about this in detail, but the issue is when you grow on these materials, when you <coughs> when you nucleate the process of the island coalescence, if the islands are too small, creates a whole pile of edge dislocations, which, which kind of kills the material as a whole. Uh, the other parts, the screw type dislocations, will typically will self-annihilate as you grow the material out, but the edge type dislocations um, will tend to run somewhat parallel to each other, so they're more problematic to um, remove. The other thing is if you don't pull this down below or down around 400 or so it becomes very hard to actually p-type dope these materials and one of the issues with the wide band gap materials as a whole is making good p-n junctions. Um, there are other issues when I come to talk about solar cells in a moment as well. So our process was to develop high quality um, silicon um, on silicon, this was for comparison. But you see the issue was with the silicon because of the thermal mismatch, the materials would crack. Uh, when we started doing these um, um, intermediate layers, they tended to, they tended to improve. Um, you would tend to see an optimum aluminum oxide thickness. This is Raman spectroscopy that told you where the material was actually starting to look, um, look somewhat better. So there was an optimum there was an optimum thickness for these. 
But you can see here we can actually get the material down to something that was somewhat reasonable, like this 20 nanometer, the off-axis reflection was um, going down. Typically, the off-axis was, um, it gives you a sense of what these edge type dislocations are um, within the material. So we were actually starting to get closer to what it was for growth on sapphire, and it was removing some of the um, thermal, thermal mismatch issues as well. So we started growing some type of LEDs on these structures. Typically, what you find for the LEDs on the silicon, uh, they tended to have a slightly higher um, series resistance. Um, and that was really for two reasons. We were making vertical devices, so these thin layers, um, we weren't necessarily doping at this time. But also, it was more difficult to p-dope the material, so that tended to increase your, um, um, your series resistance in them. So this is showing LEDs on silicon, LEDs on sapphire. These were just simple devices. Um, this is IQE measurements for the, for the devices. And the real the important thing to pull out here is that compared to bare silicon, when we did these other devices, the IQEs were somewhat similar. Again, our device structures weren't the most complicated because we were more interested in addressing the materials issues. Can you actually get the devices that work well on work well on silicon. So this is showing the LEDs, um, both on um, aluminum oxide, both on um, sapphire and on silicon. Um, and typically what you would find is that the devices on, um, on the silicon were somewhat similar um, to, the, um, to the ones on sapphire, but they would tend to degrade as we went out in wavelength. But that's typical um, for the LED structures, which you'll see um, later on when I talk about solar cells. Um, part of the reason the emission from these devices is strong is that when you grow the gallium-indium nitride, it tends to cluster the excitons localized and they don't see the defects and they, re, they kind of re-emit within these localized regions within the device. At some point, when you change the composition up or down, you start losing these um, compositional fluctuations within the material. These compositional fluctuations are somewhat of an issue when you come to solar cells. You need to get rid of them because your VOC collapses to the lowest value within the material. So when we started moving from LEDs into solar cells, the first thing we had to do was to learn how to grow the material uniformly um, at higher indium compositions so we didn't see the VOC collapse on the, um, on the devices. The other thing we were wanting to do with these devices were to actually remove the um, substrate. So um, you want to take off the silicon substrate. Um, people were using for sapphire liftoff techniques. And this is to really improve the, um, it's kind of a Snell's law thing. If you have a very thin layer, um, the light can't waveguide within the layer. So when it emits, it just comes out the device without necessarily waveguiding. When it waveguides within the device, you tend to have losses of that. So. The devices that have the highest EQE um, typically have um, our thin GAN, are actually thin GAN type um, devices. So they have a thin layer of gallium nitride and they've removed the other things that may cause the wave guiding. So what we were doing here was showing the ability to remove these um, substrates and just keep these very thin um, <coughs> epilayers. This was just on a dual in line package. This is an LED where essentially we've removed the um, substrate from the device. PL, um, or electroluminescence, stayed the same, and the behavior of the device before and after was the same. These weren't on heat sinks, so you get rollover for um, heating from these, um, from these devices. Um, the LEDs have actually become really quite complicated now. Um, I do some expert witness work as well, and I did some stuff for Samson and Osram during the summer and these devices have really become quite horrendously um, quite horrendously complicated so it's an area that I've kind of started moving um, moving on from. So the other promise for these devices is the fact that just by going in and if you remember I'll come back to this in a second in the slide you can actually go through most of the solar spectrum using gallium indium nitride from the UV down to the um, down to the infrared or that. So there is a potential to use this as a, as a universal semiconductor material. Um, and this program, originally the program I was involved in was, um, was work from Allen and Chris Honsberg when they were based at, 
and others from um, Delaware, and we got involved to make some contributions to make wide, gan wide band gap and new wide band gap materials that work beyond about 2 EV or so. I'll show you the issues. Um, and why the nitrides worked there was the fact that you actually did have good PN junctions. You also had materials which were still direct band gap materials. And my people have done this on other tandem cells of that with gallium phosphide based materials, when you start getting up to the 2 EV region, the devices start going indirect and your layers start getting thicker, the layers start getting thicker again. Typically what you're going to see on these solar cells, um, the active region, the intrinsic region where you absorb is only about 0.2 microns thick or so in these devices. So they're very thin, they're very thin devices. And these devices were also designed for um, concentration or that. I think the stuff we've kind of moved through and people should probably already know this. So if you want to move beyond something which um, <coughs> gives you a single band gap of 20 to 25, 25 to 30 percent or so, the, the traditional or the, the technique that people have typically done in the last few years is to go to these tandem or multi-junction cells of different materials um, or so. And then we can get up to the quasi shockley limit of about 86 or so. What's the issue here? The issue is that you need to look towards these devices here in this region here that if you are going towards these multiple band gaps, you have to be able to get devices that work in the UV or that. Um, and also at different wavelengths where it's typically hard to take and control the 3-5 materials to absorb in the region where you, where you actually want. And this was part of this DARPA VSEC program where the idea was to get efficiencies above about 50% um, or so in these devices. Um, or that, and our contribution was really on these wide band gap areas. So the idea was to move away from the, sorry, was to move away from this traditional, um, traditional tandem cell, where ultimately you can actually make your solar cells purely in the um, gallium indium nitride materials. Then you only have to worry about one material. You don't have to worry about the arsenic compounds. The idea here as well was not necessarily to be concerned about. In a tandem cell, you have an issue through the cells of um, current matching through the cells, um, and that tends to be the problematic issue with them. You have to current match and design your cells so you current match through the cells. So the idea with these was to externally current match the um, was to externally current match the devices, and then the nitrides are really nice and robust. So if you want to use these for um, space applications of that they're typically going to be very robust for space applications. So the VSEC program was actually taking these devices, it was splitting the power spectrum, and um, people I think at Stanford just got um, another $4 million for designing optical systems for, power, uh, for, for splitting, splitting the power spectrum just recently. So good ideas always continue. Um, to be to be worked with that, and as you can see at this front end was a high band gap material, um, and that was really where we were looking to make this contribution with the gallium indium nitride solar cells. At this time, people hadn't actually produced gallium indium nitride solar cells, um, or that, so a lot of it was new. Um, so the issue, the issue was um, primarily you had no sense of modelling. Um, and how to design for these devices. Secondly, um, things just even like the gallium nitride absorption coefficients weren't that well known. So you have to go in and design devices where you're trying to work out size of depletion regions, how much indium you can get in there, and can you actually get all the absorption you want within that region. The other issue as well as with the nitrides is that they're, they're actually hexagonal materials. So that means hexagonal semiconductors are non-central symmetric, if you know crystal theory. So the issue is when it's non-central symmetric, it means that you're going to see um, spontaneous polarization effects depending on the differences in materials you put on. And if there's strain, and those can cr create quite large fields and distribution, redistribution of carriers without strains. And when you have strains, you can also get polarization effects in there as well. So, the design of the cell can actually be fairly, can actually end up being fairly complicated because of these redistributions of charge associated with the fact that you've got a, 
you have um, a semiconductor that's essentially non central symmetric. So things we did um, were to actually go in and essentially start looking at what type of devices. And we came down to simple PIN solar cells. And typically, the N or the I region would have a lower indium concentration. Um, so we tended more towards this type of um, device. Then you don't have to worry about absorption in the, in the PGAN or the N type in the P region or the N type region of the device, you can just look at the absorption simply within the device. We stayed away, we did do some um, quantum well um, devices, but even within the solar community, I'm still not sure that people necessarily like those devices. They localize carriers, but you can't always efficiently extract carriers. So I think a simple homojunction device or some type of simple heterojunction type device um, is preferable. These type of devices we'd kind of done before for UV detectors, so we had more experience with them. Um, we had more experience with um, this type of device or that. Um, <coughs> so what we did was we took PC1C and PC1D core programs, and then we had to go in, build materials files for these new materials. Um, then we had to go back in and you'll find and modify the code so we can put in these polarization effects and that within the materials as well. Um, the materials files, I'll show you some issues with just absorption and some other things that we had to, um, that we had to address. But if you look preliminary designs, um, you can see here our depletion region is only about 0.2 microns in these. Um, and we could run this in other codes as well. Um, what else did we use? The name will, I'm a little bit tired, so the name will come back to me later on. So typically what you would actually find is that you could go towards your depletion zone was typically about 0.2 microns or so within most of these devices. So then you had an issue, independent composition almost, that you had to get all your absorption within that 0.2 micron within that 0.2 micron region of that. This was good in part as well, because it meant that the active regions could tend to be really quite, could tend to be really quite narrow. Um, then also, as I mentioned, we had to go in and stick in um, things to address the polarization effects, both the um, spontaneous polarization and the piezoelectric polarization, which can actually start producing um, sheet charge on the surface of the device. So some of the final structures we built were not obvious in terms of the fact that we may stick a, a PN junction on the top to pull out this polarization charge and make the device work. So it's kind of an interesting area to play around in. And you can see that once you actually start adding in the polarization effects, it starts changing um, the behavior of the band structure as well at the, um, at the band edge and your band edge alignments and that. Um, <coughs> let me just move on from this, we're going to run out of time. Uh, other issues we had is that typically, and to our work, uh, most people would grow in these materials for solid state lighting applications. And what you were typically doing is you were growing these five um, essentially monolayer thick um, quantum well regions where you were actually causing the material to phase separate to get these compositional fluctuations, localize the emission and give you very bright emission. The issue with um, our solar was how do we actually, how do we actually suppress that um, and up to what composition could we suppress that? So part of what we were trying to do was to address the issues of, and this is an X-ray and PL, how do we actually suppress this to get homogeneous gallium indium nitride. So the tendency is the gallium indium nitride wants to phase separate. Um, difficult material to grow because the um, vapor pressure of, I think of, in, of nitrogen over gallium nitride compared to nitrogen over indium nitride is 15 orders of magnitude difference. So when you start sticking in nitrogen, you start sticking in indium, it's harder to incorporate the nitrogen and you tend to get more impurities in there, femal ammo pinning, which also causes things such as um, point defects within the material. If your femal ammo pins and you start sticking in more centers, it has to compensate somehow and it's normally some type of point defect that typically kills the optical quality of the material. Um, this is also shown PL measurements. Um, 
over the region that we were interested in using. And certainly you can see if we weren't controlling the phase separation, you could see second order or secondary PL peaks or that. So the trick here was how do you take material that would separate out and make it single phase? And a lot of this, again, I don't have time to talk about, was how you control the kinetics of the, of the growth um, system to make the material uniform. Um, <coughs> As I mentioned, the other issue we had originally was um, with absorption coefficients. So when we were originally designing, we were designing thicker materials. But what was good is we discovered the absorption coefficients were a much, were much larger than we um, than we were expecting. So we could actually end up designing devices around this two to three hundred um, um, nanometer thick region, which was getting close to the depletion region of the material. Again, these nitrides typically you have an issue that with most, when you move away from silicon, most of these nitrides will have um, n-type background of mid-10 to the 16 or so, um, or that. And typically when you're trying to dope the materials, p-type, your p-type dopants, the, like magnesium, has about an activation energy of typically about 180 to 200 and they 250 MeV, that means only about 1% of your carriers, 1 to 2% of your carriers are actually active within the material. So you put in these centers and you're still trying to hold the material together um, and about two orders of magnitude higher doping concentrations than you'll see in free carriers within the material. So your P-type doping is typically low, 10 to the 18 in these um, layers, unless you start doing things to um, control this and this is just showing some of our original devices when we went back and modeled it um, originally we weren't taking enough of the the um, we weren't absorbing enough in the in the um, red so we did make devices I'm sorry this was um, cells and um, some of our we went through about three or four different generations of cell gen is not a good name to use here because um because of the other connotations with silicon and solar as a whole, but we go through different iterations of um, devices, and we were doing some devices at the front end to um, optimize the p-type doping. Here we were trying to dope the ingam, which again was also problematic. Indium tends to get raw oxygen and that within the layers, so it becomes harder to dope again. And the other issue we had with these wide band gap materials, we used Solux lamps and other things was because you're in this region where the power spectrum is dropping, um, a slight difference in the color temperature of the lamp or how you drive it can make a big difference in the efficiency of the um, solar cell. So we made different types of, um, we made different types of devices, um, uh, both with transparent contacts, um, semi-contracts, finger contacts. Again, I don't have enough time to show interdigitated and also research STEM um, contacts we started doing as well. I, I won't show it here, we also did some solar cells on silicon, um, and we also did homojunction um, cells of that. But we went through and optimized these, um, optimized these layers, and our final devices, we were seeing um, VLCs of about two volts. Um, we had devices where the VLCs were higher. Fill factors about 60% 60, 60 or so. Typically you find the current is low, right, because there's not a lot of photons around in the, in the ultraviolet and you're finding that these devices in terms of these um, high efficiency tandem, they're supposed to add about 6% addition to the, um, to, the, to the system or so. And this is showing some of the devices under test. Um, and these devices were designed for concentration, so they were about five millimeter, three millimeter um, squared, um, squared devices or that. This is showing VOC, I think, of what, 1.8 or that. Well, let me close out in the next couple of minutes. I'll just roll a deck. Um, when I, whenever I go somewhere new, I have a rule. Whenever I go somewhere new, I always start something new I've never touched before. Um, <coughs> so. At UNC, it was thermoelectric materials. Um, <coughs> and I also try and pick up something new every year as well, just because you, I, I call it the, the mediocrity of very good, just because you're very good or excellent at something. 
doesn't mean that you're not going to be genius at something else. So you always have to be trying something new in case you've missed your, uh, in case you've kind of missed your calling in life. So we moved into thermoelectrics, and our driver here was really the fact that <coughs> for for temperature scavenging, you want, and if you're going towards, you know, hybrid concentrated systems, you're going to have localized very high temperatures within the devices. And silicon will stop working at some point. It just won't work. Um, it just won't work well, um, or that. So. Our job here was to take the nitrides, which are wide band gap materials, tend to be more robust. Secondly, if you remember about the P-doping, it means as you actually increase the temperature of the device, your P-doping should improve because you ionize more centers within it. But you see most of these other materials drop off the temperature. I think Alan's doing these, they're ready to chuck me off. Is that right? Well, you want some questions, don't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> so I'll roll X this. So we start looking at the gallium nitride, start looking at scattering mechanisms, seabed coefficients with doping concentration within these layers. I'd done work before with this chart measuring um, thermal conductivity and we set up to do omega-3 omega. We've also done some reflectance measurements with other people. Um, in the nitrides, and it looks like the lines are faint there, you can't see them. Um, we also did this for zinc oxide, and actually this graph, we've got other points down here. All this stuff is highly materials related, so it depends on the quality of the material. Um, our main interest was doing this with the gallium indium nitride based materials. And because before we were able to control the composition for the ingan relative to the, to the um, phase separation for the solar, you find that most of our devices, the seabed coefficients tend to be much higher. And then when the materials tended to break down um, due to these compositional fluctuations around about this 0.25, you find that they would just go back and start looking like other people's materials again. You see this also with the Z, ZT factor, which I didn't have time to talk about, but ZT is a figure of merit that tells you how good this is likely to be as a TE material. So this is early days for these, um, this is early days for these materials, but the idea here is you can hopefully have an integrated PVTV system, which under concentration, the TE part can scavenge the heat. The primary issue is it's very high temperatures. So for most high temperature, most materials, unless they're wide band gap materials, won't work at high temperatures. So with that, I'll finish and thank you very much. <laughs> so I see Alan was bringing out his shepherd's hook well, to pull yeah. me off to one side. But we do, we do have three minutes, four minutes. By MLCVD. Not by ALD. Uh, not ALD. The ALD was for transitional layers on some substrate technologies. All the growth was done by MLCVD. Uh, typically, MLCVD is used for higher quality optical materials, but if you give me an MBE tool, I can use an MBE tool. It doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. So I was just wondering about what your growth temperatures were and how they varied with your indium concentration. And also, uh, well. <laughs> right, right, so, yeah, so that's, that's a lot of detail. So yeah. one, your basic nitride works about, gallium nitride just growths about 1050, but there's a whole nucleation process of nucleating amorphous, recrystallizing, then renucleating for your um, gallium indium nitrides you typically drop the temperature down and it's anywhere between, it's around about 700 to 800 degrees centigrade depending on what type of material you're growing, what composition, what growth rate you want and what you're doing with the homogeneity of the materials. And with MOCVD grown films, there's sometimes an issue with carbon and hydrogen contamination? Uh, not um, really. Do you know, you can go and look at it. Um, hydrogen, do you know, it kneels out with most semiconductor materials really, really quickly. 
Carbon really depends on the sources you use and the growth temperature. Why did I get into MLCVD? I did um, BE for years, seven or eight years, and in 95 I sat down and started designing an MBE tool to do the nitrides, and I spent an afternoon doing it, and by the time I finished designing and modifying the MBE tool, it looked like an MLCVD tool, <laughs> so I started doing MLCVD. So we should adjourn to uh, outside for any more questions, because they're all coming in right now. So let's thank Ian again. I just thought I was going to talk to you.